Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another forecast discussion. Gonna have to make this one a little bit quicker than normal. Um, this morning I will be heading out to chase myself, so I'm gonna have to make this quicker than normal, but this is a pretty complex setup, potential to be a pretty potent setup uh, for today, Tuesday, April 12th. So I wanted to get a forecast video out um, and at least discuss you, with you some of the, the basics about this event. SBC right now has a couple of enhanced risks enhanced risk areas out. First one up here uh, extends from far southern Minnesota in toward eastern Nebraska, down into eastern Kansas, and then up through much of Iowa um, for the threat for tornadoes, damaging wind, and large hail. And then a separate area of enhanced risk down toward the Dallas-Fort Worth, Waco, Austin corridor on I-35 there. An area is just a little bit west and east of there with a pretty large slight risk surrounding that um, as well. So Again, the threat for tornadoes is there across, especially the slight risk areas. The enhanced risk area up to the north has the greatest tornado potential right now, and there's been some discussion of, of increasing the tornado probabilities up here as well. Again, the day one outlook has not been released yet, and have, having to do this, this video early in the morning here before the 12Z data is in, but uh, nonetheless, the greatest tornado threat does appear to be up north, and we'll discuss that here in a second, with a Tornado threat that extends all the way south down to the Gulf Coast there and east into the Mississippi River Valley. Damaging wind and large hail, potentially significant severe hail, is going to be a threat as well. So let's show you just who's in and who's out right now. Um, so for the northern enhanced risk area right now, and again, this has been discussed um, as far as uh, increasing the, the probabilities up here to a moderate risk level, four out of five here with the day, upcoming day one outlook, but that again is not out yet. So for now, the enhanced risk covers places like Des Moines, Fort Dodge, Sioux City, Iowa, down toward the Kansas City area into far eastern Kansas, places like Topeka, Lawrence, down toward Emporia. And then for our southern risk area, or southern enhanced risk area, Dallas-Fort Worth Metro, in the under the gun today, Dallas-Fort Worth Metro, places like Denton, Gainesville, down toward the Waco, Round Rock, and Austin areas down there along the I-35 corridor as well. Slight risk again does extend out toward the Mississippi River Valley. Parts of East Texas are in the slight risk as well. Tyler, Longview, uh, Lufkin, uh, Nacogdoches, uh, places like that. Houston as well as San Antonio are in the slight risk level two out of five areas. So. Let's go ahead and get started here. This is our satellite imagery, and we've got this big kind of bowling ball trough that is positioned across the western half of the continental United States. Now it's kind of broken up into two different segments here. You've got the big main trough here across the western continental U.S. And you have this second kind of short wave down here that is centered over uh, Mexico right now. You can see the fetch of moist air aloft there uh, going into the southern plains right there on that secondary short wave. And both of these are going to be uh, players in today's severe risk. If we go to our mesoanalysis here, this is our 500 millibar map, and you can see we've got our main trough right in here, and then we've got that little extra piece of that shortwave energy that has kind of uh, separated itself, if, so to speak, from the main trough to the north. And this is going to um, continue to move off toward the east or northeast today, placing the um, North Texas area under the gun for storms today. And that's why we have that kind of separate enhanced risk area there. The um, middle part of this risk area, uh, which is why you won't see the enhanced risk area here from Wichita, basically down toward the I-35 corridor in Oklahoma, down toward the Red River, is not in the enhanced risk area. And that's because it's kind of going to be in between these two troughs as we go on through the day today. This one going to move off to the northeast, exit region going to be placed somewhere over southern Minnesota toward Iowa, eastern Nebraska, northern Missouri, northeast Kansas, while this secondary shortwave down here is going to be, its exit region going to be, um, the influence of that going to be felt kind of there in north Texas. But right in the middle here, we may have a little bit of more nebulous forcing, uh, and that's why storm coverage in the middle is going to be a little bit more conditional today than both of these areas. Uh, down south here in Texas and then up north there into the Midwest. So if we go down to 700 millibars, you'll notice several different short waves rotating around these main sort of troughs. We got one here associated with that 500 millibar trough there centered across Mexico. 
We've got one kind of in here associated with our main trough, another little kink in the flow there, and several back to the west that we won't discuss as they won't be major players today. But we do have some rain ongoing ahead of this first short wave here. And then this secondary short wave going to move into the central and southern uh, plains here, particularly into the upper Midwest there um, by this afternoon and early evening. If we go down another level, down to 850 millimars, we see we have a very, very strong low level jet here across much of the region. 60 plus knots there centered over the central plains there. And that's been pumping this kind of moisture northward. Although, especially with southern extent, we do have the winds that are coming out of the southwest. And we've talked about this for a few days now. The source region of this air is down here in the southwest, down into western Mexico. And this air is very warm, very dry. If we go to our soundings here from 0Z last night, again, so this would be 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time last night. We don't have the 12Z soundings in from this morning. But if we go out back out here to the west to that source region, take a look at how dry and uh, warm this air is. 89, 89 over 26 here at the surface. Very steep lapse rates. If we look at our lapse rate from 0 to 3 kilometers, it's 10.7 degrees Celsius per kilometer. That's what we call super adiabatic. That means the air, the um, temperature decrease with height is so, so fast that pretty much if you breathe on the atmosphere, it's going to start rising. Uh, that's because it's uh, the temperature decreases super fast with height. So the lapse rates aloft here are, are extremely, extremely steep. And that's what's being that's what has been and is being invected into this region. So this morning, especially with southern extent, there's going to be a pretty strong cap on the atmosphere um, that is going to need to be broken somehow. And unlike yesterday, where we had kind of nebulous forcing, we're going to have these short waves, these stronger troughs to impinge into the region today, particularly in the northern plains and then again in the southern plains, to help erode that cap along with surface heating. So the cap should be more easily broken today. I would I would expect that the 12Z soundings come in with quite a bit of an elevated mixed layer there across the, across pretty much the entire region here, especially into the southern plains, making storm initiation uh, a little bit more conditional here with southern extent, meaning that the uh, storm coverage may be quite low given the um, kind of subtle nature of at least this secondary shortwave down here uh, and sort of the capping aloft, but storms that do form will be in a high wind shear, high instability environment uh, with, with the potential to produce all severe hazards. Um, so uh, let's take a look at our surface map here, see where our dew points are right now. So this is going to be 7 a.m. just a couple minutes ago here. So you'll notice our 70s dew points are kind of still confined here to kind of east and south central Texas there, south of basically the San Antonio area um, and over toward the Texas Gulf Coast. But we still have pretty solid surface moisture there that has uh, surged on shore, upper 60s dew point, mid to upper 60s dew points all the way up to the Red River with mid, mid 60s dew points into Oklahoma there and 60s uh, creeping up into Kansas as well. Farther north, over the northern enhanced risk area this is not not what I love to see on the morning of a severe weather event. 47 over 30 there, 40 over 28. So very, very meager dew points at this point into the target area. But you'll notice that surface flow is pretty strong it's because we should have a well-defined surface low out here from the overnight hours. Um, and if we go up here to the north, yeah, we see some sort of cyclonic circulation up in there up into Wyoming, into the Dakotas, uh, and we should uh, maintain that surface cyclogenesis today as that southwesterly flow traverses the Rockies, and on the lee side of that, the Rockies, we should get surface low development somewhere here um, on the east side of the Rockies, and that should maintain this southeasterly flow, continue to pump that moisture northward uh, and northeastward into the target areas for today. Now, what is a little bit um, I, well, of a caveat for today is how quickly that moisture is going to return. We already have 50 dew points up into north central Missouri, 60 dew points basically to the Arkansas Missouri border here. Uh, is that going to be enough to, are we going to have enough time to pump all this moisture northward 
into the surface low that's going to develop probably somewhere out here in eastern Colorado, move off to the northeast. It's probably set up somewhere up over here into south Nebraska. Some of the models are showing that it does make it all the way up here. But some of the models are also showing that the moisture is pretty meager up here into Iowa and eastern Nebraska with only a sliver of, of upper, upper 50s dew points, very pinched kind of warm sector up here. So that'll be something we'll have to watch. Um, and we'll continue to talk about that in a second. Moisture, at least at the surface, not much of an issue here with southern extent. Um, perhaps moisture quality is a little bit of an issue. If we take a look at our Corpus Christi sounding from last night, we do have a decently steep moist layer there. It goes up to about 850 millibars, so that's pretty good. That's a little bit of an improvement. We do have pretty decent evidence of that very stout elevated mixed layer aloft here. Again, these are last night's soundings. So very steep lapse rates aloft. Very strong instability with this profile as well, although it, it is it is quite capped given that EML aloft. Um, so I would expect to see something similar today. Um, strong instability expected to build all day. Uh, that cap expected to hold through at least early to mid afternoon before that short wave impinges into the region. But at, at least a decently deep moist layer there at Corpus Christi. This was the Dallas Fort Worth sounding. Dallas Fort Worth actually got completely uncapped yesterday. Um, thanks to a little bit of, of um, strong surface heating uh, and a little bit of an influence from perhaps a little bit of a, a wave, I, I believe, that came out uh, into the region uh, yesterday. Um, so you can see decently, a little slightly mixed there, decently steep moist layer and completely uncapped. So if we can get this along the dry line today, all the way up and down the dry line uh, today, um, there is the chance for storms to fire particularly again with southern extent thanks to that secondary shortwave there um, into Texas. So let's go ahead and take a look at the models here. This is going to be the 9Z wrap model. Uh, the 12Z NAM that we usually use is not quite out yet. So you, we can see the progression of this trough today. You can see it becomes quite negatively tilted. And again, we've got these two different areas here. This first one, very potent negatively tilted shortwave uh, trough right there uh, it, with nice defluence aloft spreading out of those wind vectors uh, aloft, spreading into eastern Nebraska, western Iowa, southwest Minnesota by mid to late afternoon. Then we've got this secondary shortwave out here into Texas. And we'll notice the timing of this feature. This is 18Z, so 1 p.m. You can see where that the axis kind of is right there, already impinging into central Texas. So we may see storm initiation a little bit earlier uh, here in north central and central to east central Texas there. Um, so that will be something to watch as far as storm initiation goes. Um, although it may remain capped, we're, we'll have to kind of look at the 12Z soundings to determine how capped the atmosphere is. And then the shortwave kind of moves off into east Texas, Louisiana there by early evening. Could initiate a second batch of storms out here in the open warm sector up here in the north, east Texas, north central Louisiana, southern Arkansas. Um, and then our secondary wave up there into east Nebraska, uh, into western Iowa. Should be plenty to initiate storms there by late afternoon. If we go down to 700 millibars, we can kind of better see our short waves here. We've got that first short wave that moves off into um, the Dakotas, into Minnesota there by uh, late morning, early afternoon, by, right about lunchtime. There, should, there could be easily some storms associated with this shortwave here. Um, so we'll have to monitor that, see how much that inhibits surface destabilization, surface heating there with, the, with northern extent. But we also have, so here we go. We've got kind of the secondary shortwave back there. By late afternoon, that should be enough to initiate storms there up into eastern Nebraska, western Iowa, and then this one here into north central and east central Texas there. Low level jet should remain fairly strong throughout the day given that continued surface low development out to the Lee of the Rockies there. And we do have a pretty strong low level jet here. This is by 7 p.m. tonight. Very strong low level jet here extending from um, the Great Lakes region down into Iowa, into eastern Kansas, and down into um, Oklahoma as well. Still extending a little bit into Texas as well perhaps a little bit lesser of an extent down there. So wind shear with southern extent may be a little bit less. Um, and then you see that low level jet really ramp up after dark as we usually see. 
And then with our surface pattern here, so our surface pattern is going to be critical where that sets up today as far as the storm threat goes. So you can see where that surface low is up there. In, so this is at 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time here. You can see here's our surface low up there in far northeast Nebraska. And you can see out here on the NAM, the warm sector kind of gets a little bit pinched off ahead of that low. There's not much room ahead of that low on that triple point there. So it's going to be a tight, um, confined parameter space up there, I believe. But we should have a very strong dry line to the south that extends well into Texas with a broad warm sector out ahead of it. And if we look at our dew points there, you can see. So the RAP model actually does get the 60s dew points up there into northern Iowa, uh, northwest Iowa there, by uh, peak heating there. So interesting to note, the RAP model does uh, get the 60s dew points up there into um, even far South Dakota. But that would push that warm sector off, that triple point up there, all the way up almost into Southeast South Dakota there. Um, so that's going to be a long haul for chasers who chased in Arkansas yesterday. But this has been the sticking point with some of the models for this setup. If we look at, let's look at a couple different models here. So this is going to be the 6Z NAM. And you can see there's still quite a bit of discrepancy where this um, surface low is going to set up and where the, that kind of triple point is going to set up. 6Z NAM has it somewhere up here in northeast Nebraska. So the warm sector will be somewhere, um, or at least the triple point will be somewhere up there with kind of that warm sector extending into southern Iowa. If we look, we saw that what the RAP did. The HER model makes the, takes the moisture all the way up there as well. 6Z GFS, again, that's not even close. So it, it brings the 60s up and has the low somewhere in north west, northwest Iowa. So you can see here still quite a bit of discrepancy on a lot of the models where that triple point is going to set up. But wherever it sets up, there will be at least a small... Uh, confined area of solid parameter space, decent moisture there, um, out ahead of it. And given the forcing from that short wave, uh, the main short wave, that sh there should be enough to initiate storms here ahead of that surface low um, by um, perhaps even as early as mid-afternoon. And then by by late, that cold front starts to take over, starts to progress east, and east, and we should get uh, more storm development along that um, as the cold front takes over. Should get more of a linear mode there um, but um, by early evening. But discrete supercell development definitely possible here ahead, ahead of the surface low, depending on where it sets up um, late this afternoon and evening up there into Iowa, even though the parameter space looks to be a little bit confined, at least spatially. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Again, whether or not those that best moisture is going to make it up there um, is still in question, um, and we're going to have to monitor that throughout the day. Let's go down south to our, let's go to the middle portion of the dry line here. So you can see that moisture continues to stream northward throughout the day. We get kind of this tight dry line to develop by uh, mid to late afternoon. There will be southwesterly winds to the west of that, southerly or southeasterly winds to the east of the dry line, and that could be enough to initiate storms here up into east central Kansas or so, um, but that remains to be seen. Again, it's going to kind of be between the two troughs, so there may be some subsidence or sinking motion here in the middle part of this dry line from central Oklahoma up into um, north central Kansas. So that's why the SBC has not highlight highlighted this in an enhanced risk area yet, but we're going to have to watch. The dry line circulation may be enough to initiate storms here along it, and if, if that does happen, Again, steep lapse rates aloft, um, and the threat for a more discrete mode here would favor um, supercells with significant severe weather. But again, the questions remain on whether that's actually going to happen, given that it's kind of between the two troughs. Now, down here into Texas, we're seeing the influence of that short wave here. The wrap has not a super tight dry line here, actually, into Texas. The NAM, on the other hand, has a very tight dry line, at least the 6Z NAM has a pretty tight dry line. This would favor a stronger dry line circulation, more convergence along that dry line, and the perhaps a slightly greater potential for storms up on the middle portion of the dry line there, central Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, up toward kind of the Topeka, the I-70 corridor there into Kansas. Now down in Texas, the dry line's a little bit more slanted, but there's maybe a little bit of a bulge here in the dry line 
up into north central Texas. Gonna have to watch that. We all often like to target dry line bulges because the winds are a little bit stronger, a little bit more convergence along that dry line bulge. So we'll have to uh, keep in mind, keep that in mind. If that does play out, that may be a favored target area for severe weather today. But again, coverage may be low given the degree of capping. Let's take a few soundings here. We'll start. Let's go back up to our. Um, our Iowa play up here, so right on the triple point there. NAM does get the best moisture up there. So you can see uncapped atmosphere here by 0Z, 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time with very large looping hodographs up here. Would favor the threat for discrete supercells with strong tornadoes, very large hail, and some damaging winds before that linear mode kind of takes over this evening. Let's go down south along the dry line there into Kansas. We'll do uh, central Kansas there. We'll do kind of we'll do one right at Oklahoma City there, ahead of the dry line in Oklahoma. And you can see the NAM remains capped. The NAM keeps that area capped. Some subsidence there between the two troughs, um, but still steep, very strong instability, very large looping hodographs there into Kansas, close a little bit closer to the upper flow, so a little bit greater shear up here along this portion of the dry line. Um, so going to have to be watched if storms if a storm or two does fire on the dry line would have the potential to produce tornadoes perhaps a couple strong tornadoes um, a very large hail and damaging winds but again the threat for um, the I-70 corridor central Kansas into eastern Kansas down through the eastern two-thirds of Oklahoma is quite conditional at this point you can see Oklahoma City here a little bit less shear but very strong instability does remain capped the NAM, this is the NAM also, 60 NAM, so the 75 degree temperature here at 0Z may be a little bit underdone by 5 to even 10 degrees. So if we can get uh, mid to upper 80s here, uh, low to mid 80s at least, um, we would kind of erode that cap a little bit more and have a greater potential for storms to fire. But again, quite conditional given that it's kind of sandwiched between the two troughs there. With southern extent, here into Texas. Let's go here right ahead of that dry line bulge, just to the northeast, northwest side of the Dallas Fort Worth metro area. And then we'll do one down here, kind of in the Waco area along the I 35 corridor. So you can see here, we, we do get quite close to complete cap erosion down here. The moist layer is quite shallow. And I don't know if I absolutely buy that. Given what we saw in the 0Z soundings from last night, the moist layer at Corpus Christi was quite. It was was decently deep. Nothing, you know, groundbreaking or anything, but it was decently deep. And, you know, if there is a cap on the atmosphere for most of the day, as we've talked about before, the mixing should remain at bay. So the dew points won't crater. We won't get that dry air to really mix down to the surface. So I'm a little bit skeptical of these of this NAM sounding down here for um at least for Texas. This is going to be, again, near the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. This is a little bit farther removed from the greatest forcing, so the hodographs are actually quite short here. But still adequate clockwise curvature in the low levels. Would favor maybe a more high precipitation storm mode in storms that do fire. Very large hail risk would be the main risk with these storms, maybe an outside chance of a tornado or two. Um, so this is farther south along the dry line into central Texas. I-35 corridor near Waco, and kind of the same thing. Cap really doesn't erode fully here on the NAM, but we'll have to watch that and see what the morning soundings show as far as how capped the atmosphere is. With southern extent, a little bit longer hodographs because we're a little bit closer to that secondary shore wave. So large hail, the main threat, I think, down here in Texas with an outside chance of a tornado or two with these storms. So. Um, let's look finally here at some of the convective allowing models just to give you kind of a, a guess at what the radar might look like later on, and then we'll wrap things up here. So this is the HRRR model. Um, this is the 10Z run. We'll see if the 11Z is out. Let's do, the, let's do the 10Z run here. So we go on. We see we do have some storms throughout the early afternoon here. That moves out quickly on this run. And you can see storms start to fire up here into far eastern South Dakota. These would likely be elevated because the moisture plume, if you remember, is kind of up in here. So these would be kind of elevated up ahead north of the best moisture plume there. And then we get additional storms to fire later on into uh, north central Iowa, into southwest Minnesota. 
So with Southern extent, these would be more to have a tendency to more be surface based. Again, I'm not 100% sure that these are all going to be surface based storms. Again, the, the moisture plume, if it makes it up there, um, is going to be quite confined spatially. And so these may, a lot of these may be north of the front, north of the warm front, north of the best moisture, uh, and they're going to be elevated, which would pretty much negate the tornado threat and focus on a large hail threat instead. But if we look at, if we take this and we look at where our um, moisture is, so keep an eye, keep uh, remember where these storms are. We're going to look at the moisture here. So you can see these storms up here into Minnesota are, are quite into meager moisture there, perhaps north of the, the main warm front there, which would be somewhere, this is the surface low, the warm front kind of drapes somewhere in there, and a lot of those storms were north of the front. The ones down here in Iowa would have the best potential to be tornadic supercells, given that they're tapping into the south side of that warm front, the warm sector there. So potential for tornadic supercells does exist there into southern Iowa. If we go down the dry line here, let's go down to the central sector here, and we will go to our um, reflectivity here. You know, you'll notice here that the her struggles to fire much of anything except along the cold front there down into Kansas late this evening. Oklahoma, Kansas remains dry. Well, if we go to our southern plains sector, you'll see that we have, looks like just some hailers there. Again, this regime out here needs to be watched as well, southern Arkansas into Louisiana and East Texas for the potential for supercells out ahead in this warm advection regime. But the her struggles a little bit, perhaps remains quite capped there, but does initiate storms down there into north central Texas, um, into Oklahoma by late afternoon, early evening. So that'll be something to watch. Let's take a look at the ARW here see what happens here along the southern portion of the dry line. And so the ARW does initiate storms down here along the I-35 corridor from Dallas down toward the Waco, kind of round rock areas there. And that will move off to the east as kind of a line there. And again, this regime out here to the east needs to be watched for supercells in it as well as the shear will be high um, and the instability will be adequate out there as well. We go north along the um, dry line there, our central portion of the outlook area, and not much in the way of storm development there across Kansas and Oklahoma, and we do get tornadic supercells to fire up there into Iowa um, by late afternoon, early evening. Again, a lot of these may be elevated. The ones with southern, that are more southern, uh, may have the best chance of tapping into that warm sector and have the best chance for producing tornadoes, perhaps some strong given these shear profiles up there. So. That's all we have for now. Again, this outlook may change here by the time you see this. So if there's a moderate risk up here, don't be surprised. The SPC has talked about increasing the risk up here for parts of, of this kind of enhanced risk area up here. But for now, two different enhanced risk areas with the best severe threat today. Iowa into eastern Nebraska, northeast Kansas, northwest Missouri. And then the second area down there along the I-35 corridor into north Texas, places like uh, Denton, Dallas, down toward Waco, uh, Round Rock, Temple, and Austin, and areas around there. Again, the main threat down here sh should be large hail, given the steep lapse rates aloft, um, but a tornado or two is still possible down here as well. Um, and if we can get storms to fire down here in the middle, from kind of central Kansas down into Oklahoma, again, kind of in between the two troughs, so maybe some subsidence, less forcing there to get storms to go in that middle area. But if storms do go, they will be isolated and they will have the chance to produce significant severe weather, including tornadoes and very large hail. And then up here, the tornado threat appears to be best given strongest shear and uh, the greatest chance, greatest probabilities for storm development itself up here into eastern Nebraska, west central Iowa. Discrete supercells possible with perhaps uh, some tornadoes, a couple strong, uh, and large hail and damaging winds before the cold front overtakes the dry line late this evening and produces more of a damaging wind threat with that squall line. So that's all we have for now. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.